ahead and get this and get this meeting started for Monday, July 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, we will we uh, will expect Linda Caprera who will be here late and we are seeing Roy Weymouth at the moment. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America at this time we'll open it up for any public comment so uh, i see priscilla jenkins is joining us right now and then she had mentioned that she wanted to make a public comment i'll see her There she is. Hi. Priscilla, we're at the public comment session. Did you want to make a, some public comments? Well, just a brief one right now because I couldn't get a car to get over there in time. But I just want to uh, say I'm really disappointed that the town council is not um, looking at opportunities to uh, provide uh, recreation more often than it does another whole story and I read the uh, to defend the why in our town but it doesn't have the kind of thing that we're talking about which is like this town fair where people can get together uh, you don't have to spend money um, and you can enjoy the beauty of our natural resources um, <clears throat> so I will come in at some point because uh, the team I'm working with wants to present an official proposal to make a, uh, I have to I have to work with the recreation department and Lonnie and everybody to make a proposal to the town to do this uh, event. Um, and I was distressed to hear by the way that um, when we looked at the insurance, it looks like the town doesn't even have insurance coverage. Uh, anyway, uh, lest I wax a little bit angry, uh, Shannon, when you've talked to people about it, because you said you would talk to people about it, what kind of feedback have you gotten? Um, the feedback that I've received so far is um, insurance is the biggest concern. Uh, and then also the lack of support, I mean, from people to actually organize and put it together. Um, we're having a hard time trying to find people that are able to, that don't have too much on their plate. That's most common what I've problem, heard. common problem, right? But we had a good event last year, even though we had basically three organizers. So I think we can do that kind of thing again. So I want to hold on now and I will uh, work with Lonnie and we'll bring back a more formal um, presentation. Um, I do think that the town can do more than just sports for our families and um, we do a good job with schools, so this is a different ilk. Um, so thank you. I will be back and see you guys sometime. Thank you, Priscilla. Unless you got questions, unless you got questions right now. Time, Priscilla. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Is there any other public comment? Anyone on Zoom? I'm just going to hang around. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, we'll close public comment. We'll move on to item 110, consideration of the transient seller permit application from Yarn Hustler. Do we have any representation? Excellent. Thank you. Um, can we have so we folks come and uh, yeah. just give us a minute. Yeah. Don't worry, we'll turn the spotlight on for you. So are you Lewis? Yes, I'm Louis Salt. Salt, very nice to meet you. Um, so we understand that you're going to be selling crafts. Yeah. Are you planning on setting it up anywhere particular? I'm actually, I don't know where to actually set up. 
That's why I'm here trying to find out where I can set up. Yeah. Okay. No. Um. What we were wondering is is like we, we were we were can't even talk this morning. Um. Any public areas is. I mean, I know that for private, like you'd have to ask permission. But as far as like public, like the beach and that type of thing, is it? Are there places that we would have to ask permission to set up? If it's public. If it's public. Yeah, ma'am. I don't. I don't know the answer to that right off. I'm not aware of any ordinance that okay. restricts that sort of activity on public property. Sure. But I tell you what. So my my business card's over there. So so if you want to pick up one of those and call me tomorrow, we'll. We'll, we'll get this hashed out. Yeah, because we were just, you know, because we were thinking the beach and then there were a couple of other places that we saw. Um, and we didn't, in other words, we didn't want to impose. Sure. And say, okay, we're going to set up here. The owners come out and no, you can't set up here because we didn't give you permission. Yeah. It's that It's that type of thing. Yeah, so. I have seen vendors in the uh, municipal lot along Main Street and that, okay. that has never seemed to be a an issue so but okay. but call me tomorrow and we'll uh, we'll figure out some spaces where you can be sure sure and your business card you said was where it's it's right over here on this small desk. we do have one question as well from oh, Wes. yeah i just wanted to mention that the sort of a semi permanent area is trying to be very region yep so that's how that the region generally occupies okay okay all right thank you <laughs> you sell crafts and yarn no, actually, so what I do is I just do um, latch hook. What I do is make things out of yarn with latch hook. And right now I'm making American flags out of uh, yarn, uh, out of the uh, latch hook. Mm. Uh, I move to approve the transient seller permit for yarn. I'll, start. I'll second. All in favor? All in favor? We'd love to. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Item 111, consideration of warning a contract to Haley Ward in response to a request for proposals for tax map conversion services. Do we have any questions or comments from the council? It, it was my original understanding that tax map could be overlaid with zoning maps. And is that going to work out as we go? Yeah, so with the GIS site, and, and we have joining us online, Ben Metter, and Ben is with Haley Ward, is who is the vendor that we are recommending that the town contract with for this service. But uh, but when you go on these sites, Sandy, for other communities, one some of the information that you can access is which zone each particular parcel is in. So So if you're looking at a particular parcel, part of the assessing information will include its zoning. Yes, yeah, so so typically there are overlays where you can see what what the what the different zones are. Yeah, hey. are you hoping for me to respond? Oh. Sorry, but some par properties might be partially in one zone, partially in the other. Yeah, sure. But historical misery, that particular aspect of the situation. Yeah, sure, Ben. If you have some light, you can shed on this, please. Uh, sure. So um, when we create an online portal. Um, whatever data that you have, uh, it sounds like from looking at your meeting minutes that you've just rezoned. Um, so you had to affirm rezone your town. You've probably got a spatial file that represents where all the zones are. Uh, very easy to upload onto the interactive map. Um, most interactive maps would have, um, you know, your parcel mesh is kind of like the base of everything with like an aerial or your roads. Um, what you can do is just add any layers that you want to toggle on and off. So if a zoning map or, you know, the zoning categories is something that you want on there, uh, that could definitely be part of it. Um, resource protection, wetlands, all that kind of stuff. So um, it kind of provides, it's like an interactive version of your tax map booklet um, is kind of what the online viewer is supposed to be. Does that answer your questions? I believe it does. Thank you. Sure. So oh, uh, I went online and looked at that Casco, that link, and I thought that was a pretty good map. I didn't see the layers, though. That Wait, Does Casco have layers like that? So Casco, um, that 
that contract is actually something I did with a previous firm. And um, my firm actually did uh, the tax. We did the zoning map and we did the we did shoreland zone, um, environmental conditions, and then we did a tax, a physical tax map booklet. I believe that they actually host their online map with CAI technologies is the firm that they had do that. So I'm not actually familiar with, with, their, with their online map, but that is something, you know, ostensibly they could load in there if they haven't already. Um, but yeah, I, I listed Anthony Ward as, I've worked with him quite a bit as one of our, our, research, our resources. And in the proposal, the, you can speak to the, the tax, the physical tax map work we did. So um, the physical print booklet that has all of the, the maps in it. But, but to answer your question, Roy, as Ben said a little earlier, whatever sort of data that we have, we can we can create an overlay. I just wanted to go be wonder if I could go online and just look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, couple other questions. Where does the data come from as far as property ownership? Uh, boundary lines, all that stuff. Where does that come from that they're going to get this? From our assessor. Are we going to make sure everything's updated before we do this? Yes. Are you going to put outdated information on there? No. So so we are going to be working with our assessor to make sure it's it's accurate and correct. So the and properties then, will be verified before they're put. Yeah. And, and I think, Roy, this is actually going to make it easier because right now, and I'm sure you probably access this, you go into the code enforcement officer's office you got that big tattered book and anytime a property is split, you know, someone takes a pencil and, and draws it. That's not accurate at all. Or it does nothing at all. Or, or nothing at all. And so, and so this is going to be a lot more accurate than what we've had over the last 10 years. All right. Thanks. Anthony, I have a question. Does, is the information that, uh, that his firm has, is that something that's, not necessarily like does he have the ability to third party it or yes and so and so Haley Ward has already been in contact with RJD which is our appraiser and uh because one of the things the questions I had for Ben is in two years we're going to be looking at a um, a revaluation and that's going to change all the assessing data and so is that going to uh, come with an extra cost and so Haley Ward's been in contact with RJD and they said that's going to be a seamless transition so the tax maps and the zoning maps will be overlaid so that there's no extra expense incurred. We can toggle from one to the other. That's right. Okay. That's what it's so and the average person that's not too smart with computers should be able to handle that. I mean, you know, GIS websites can be rather complicated at times, but I have found the ones that um, that we've looked at from Haley Ward to be very intuitive. So I don't think that they're they're difficult to manipulate at all. And part of it is what you do is if you're looking for a particular parcel, you type in the address of whatever parcel that you're looking for. It zeroes in on that. And then you can access all the, the information about that particular parcel. So there's not a whole lot of um, searching for information. And typically there's a menu. And as Ben said, you can access all sorts of overlays. You know, there may be a, a Google Earth view or a street view or, you know, what your streets are. So Yes, what I'm asking is, uh, if you look at um, 135 South for a couple of miles on, you know, and then can you put the tax map on top of that and see where the um, the zones intersect with the properties? Yes, that's going to be one of the overlays. Yeah, it should be. And uh, Ben, <clears throat> is there in your other? projects have you established like a kiosk at the, at the town office where individuals from the public can utilize an interface right there um i haven't done that before but um the nice thing about arcgis online is that it's kind of like one web it's all it's all browser based so whatever the the solution is can either could just be pulled up on a browser and made full screen on any kind of touch screen if you're when you say kiosk i'm imagining you're thinking of like a large touch screen monitor or something where you can use your fingers or a mouse to click. Is that kind of what you're talking yeah. about when you say kiosk? Right. Like, so if the assessor needed to, if they had someone come in here or if Dawn or someone else needed to be able to have a, a discussion and have that visible like that. Yep. Definitely possible. And much, I would say much more 
if you're looking to buy hardware much more affordable than it used to be, like let's say you wanted a big touchscreen monitor, that's not in the scope that we proposed, but um, the, the interactive map that we proposed would be easy to load onto uh, a touchscreen of that nature. I did that for a, a separate project for a university at one point. They wanted to have like a really, really large touchscreen where you could kind of interact with the map. Um, so definitely possible to do that. Um, and just to demystify a little bit, um, I think we've kind of been talking about the assessor and how does the map get integrated with all this stuff. Um, it, it's it's kind of as simple as imagine every different theme being a layer that you can just turn on and off. So anything that you have information for, we can include. And then in terms of your data, we're using existing geometries and making those much, much better with deeds, surveys, that kind of information. Um, and then joining it to assessor data. So every parcel also has your assessor data. So, um, but anyway, in terms of a kiosk, I think, we, you know, in our scope, we have a physical, uh, paper, a new physical paper map um, booklet in the, in the same kind of style as the old one, but with all the updated data. Um, and in terms of a kiosk, um, you know, outside of scope in terms of like the hardware, but very easy to implement with our existing agree agreement. So hope that answers. I guess one of the things I'm looking at is, for instance, at planning and zoning board meetings, when they're discussing where the property lines are, where the zoning lines are compared to the property lines, will they be able to come in this room and use these monitors to bring up um, the information they all want to look at and the applicants want to look I'm at? Show, I'm going to show you something real quick. There it is. So just like I called up that map, Don will be able to do this very same thing during a uh, planning board meeting. Okay, only with a lot, a lot smaller sections and a lot more clarity. Well, yeah. So what she'll be doing is she'll actually be accessing the website and, and just projecting it up on these screens. I'm good. And I would say um, also just to chime in here, uh, the difference between the online map tool and your kind of traditional maps is that it's we call them slippy maps. So like when you use Google Maps, you can zoom in and zoom out. Um, this online tool is something like that. So instead of your zoning map where you're kind of like, oh, I want to see the little tiny parcels, you can just zoom in and see what the data say at multiple scales. So this question is for you, Anthony. Do we have uh we talked about using R is it RJD to get the to get some of the data for this? Yes. Is there going to be an additional cost from them to do that? No. Or that would be included in no. We are it's just time. it's just Haley Ward accessing those data files. Right. And then what about training or uploading new information into the system? So that will happen on a um, every other year basis if there are changes in properties, and um, and that's part of the, that's part of the contract. Is that is that. Each year, there'll be a hosting fee of $750 for the GIS site, and then there'll be a charge of approximately $2,000 just for the updating of the data. Is that, you said just said biannual. It says here annual. Yeah, it'll be biannual. It'll be every other year because we have so few changes over the course of a year. It did, to me, it didn't make sense to do that on an annual basis, but to do it on a biannual basis. Okay. And that's something that we could maybe discuss in a fee structure or sort of like project stuff what do you mean it's going to be a, an additional cost for the town to have this so say planning hmm. maybe possible down the line you have thoughts i had a question <laughs> well, well step up to the microphone do you have thoughts about what what can you repeat that scenario like a fee to try to help cover some of this maybe down the line so oh, ma'am will you introduce yourself please i'm sorry don emerson town planner hi, hi don Hi there, and I apologize. I don't think I'm still grasping what. So, the so I was wondering if there, if if we might be thinking about down the line adding a fee structure to help with the implementation or the biannual seven hundred dollars or whatnot, um, as a part of applications through development. So when applications come in, could we have a piece? Of, yeah, we could certainly do that. I've not done it before, but it's seems practical. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe part of the fee. More than yep. one update or something yeah. broken up subdivision. We'll look into that, but I think that's something that's practical. Kind of pass that cost on, and then I do have a question. If it's okay for the um, for the company, we work with iWorks, and 
we have our data sent to them. So we actually have a parcel map with zoning, but it's not current. Is that something that you would do for us is export that data file to a company like iWorks? Um, yeah, I mean, assuming they're working in the industry standards, the, whether it's a geo database or a shape file, um, you know, we kind of go back and forth uh, with a lot of different firms and if, uh, assuming they're willing to share their information and we can, we're always willing to export and share our information if the, you know, if the client wants it or approves of it. So um, the data that we update, if you have iWorks using that, then they should get that file because you guys are owners of the, of the data that we, that we manage. So. Right. And just so the council, I'm not sure if you're aware, iWorks is the permitting process software that you all purchase so we can track permits, building permits, electrical, planning, all of that. So it's an existing system, and now we'll have the current information involved. And then question for you, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, interfacing. Right now, do you have, like, a, in your mind how that would work? I mean, having to, obviously, if you have some coming in questions coming out here, turning it on, in my mind, probably not practical, but do you feel like you have infrastructure? In terms of for the general public, or you mean during a meeting? Uh, general public or contractors. So if the general public came in, I would share my screen with them okay, in right. my office. But it is possible that we could come here and use this. I know that Anthony had a Zoom meeting. It was just three of us the other day in here, and, and that was helpful, having the larger screens. So I could do either. Yeah. People it, can also pull this up on their phone. Um, it's all yeah. available. Yeah. And again, I mean, I think this is a huge step forward when you consider that we have 10 year old maps that are literally just like falling apart back there that have been drawn on in order to uh, to serve as an update. We'll be able to access that. That's the machine. Yes, it's web based. Yeah. And there's no law. In no, no, it'll be a page on the on the town's website. Make a, I guess I'll make a motion. Uh, I just want to address oh, two quick. Go for it. Under the memo provided, it also states that there are two good options for funding the first year costs of the 18750 or 18000 I think it was. Uh, so that included, right now we have $123,636 in American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA funds that must be appropriated by the year's end. Uh, we also have $888,120 in fiscal year 23 surplus funds assigned to the fund balance for capital reserves. Uh, so there was a recommendation that we use our ARPA funds, um, and I know that we are also considering a list of other things to use those ARPA funds for. Is, is this fits the ARPA fund? It does. It does. And, and, and as Shannon said, either one of those is a very viable option for funding this. The only reason that I suggested ARPA is simply because we're now facing a, a deadline for getting everything appropriated. Don, do you have a question? Good. I apologize. Um, and this is a, pertaining to the data again. When the planning board approves a subdivision, if we get the CAD file, can you incorporate that indirectly so that we have survey quality information? Absolutely. And we'd love that. Um, you know, the caveat being, depending on the surveyor, sometimes CAD files, anyway, too much information, but the, the, the coordinate system might be different, but if you have a CAD file, always great. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, usually we're working with old deeds and paper, paper surveys. So CAD files are awesome. Send them our way. We will require that then. All right. So um, I'll make a motion. Uh to approve the contract with Haley Ward for Cat's Map Conversion Services to be funded with the ARPA proceeds from the American Rescue Plan. Okay. All right, all in favor? All are in favor, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for coming in and answering questions. Uh, my pleasure, looking forward to working with you. We'll see you. All right, moving on to item 112, consideration of adopting the updated zoning map as recommended by the planning board. I think we just got a preview of that. So, uh, so yeah, while Don is stepping to the mic, I'll, uh, I'll throw this up on the screen again. So... Planning board, prior to my arrival, has been working on this project for quite a while of creating a digital version of the zoning map. 
So what you see here this evening is supposed to be duplicative of what you look at the tax maps and Anthony was talking about flipping the sheets. So two of the planning board members went through the tax maps sheet by sheet, parcel by parcel with GB, GP COG and they came up with this. So this is not to include any map changes. If there are any changes, changes then that would be, excuse me, an oversight. We, we posted it online to the public to ask for input for several weeks before the board forwarded it to you once it was complete. And we do recognize that if there are errors, unfortunately, maybe something that comes up case by case, if someone applies for a permit and they say, hey, wait a minute. But um, we did attempt to get public input. And again, there's not supposed to be any changes. It's supposed to be what you have today, just in a different format. Are there any questions from the council? And so it may be important to note that the reason that we're bringing this to you is we want your approval so that we can then certify this map and it becomes the official zoning map for the town. In the board, planning board. So this is this is the map that we that I was when, when you and I met there back a while ago. Correct. This is the map right there that shows incorrect data when it comes to that region. This is the map we were looking for. Remember I said that we sent it out? Yep. This is it. So that's oh. not correct in that area, according to other other state maps that we had looked at. I'm afraid I'm in the same boat. Yeah. Hey, look at resource protection going up into my property. They, it stops a half mile down the road. And it's always going to be field verified. So if it doesn't exist on the face of the earth, then it's not going to apply. So Dawn, explain what that means. So your property lies in the shoreland zone and it's showing the yellow shoreland zone. Now the shoreland zone is 250 feet deep and there are setbacks and special provisions in that. So that 250 feet that you see on the zoning map is not to scale. It's always actually in the field going to be based on the measurement from the high water line 250 feet back. So I mentioned earlier about survey quality maps. You know, these these maps are broad and everything has to be field verified. Is that clear? Does it, and did I answer your question about the resource protection and the field verification? Does that clarify that? that. Here. State the state stops their rep okay. this one continued. I know have the same problem. You know, uh, it was public water supply. Okay, this map is at least 500 feet uh, further uh, from the water than the actual measured distance. I can't go to. Where did where did the data come from that is overlaid on this map? KB Cog um, created the map. They, sourced? they they take the data from the state, the beginning with habitat maps, and some of the um, we talked about the state geological survey. So there's multiple layers, but they generally come from the state. Uh, is that reference? The lower right. Do you have uh, detailed sourcing from them? We have some of the individual layers that have been mapped. Um, I actually have printed copies, and that's what Rory was talking about. We were looking at some of the actual printed copies saying, um, here's where the flood zone is, and here's where wading um, bird habitat is. So there's there's different maps that we have that you could look at, plus they're also online in PDF format. But they, I don't know what KVCOG did in terms of looking at those in comparison to this. I, I've made an assumption that those are the layers that they turn on and off. So, and this would be inclusive of all of those layers. If that's the actual means that they did, I, I'm not, I couldn't say 100%, I'm making an assumption, I'd have to check with them. 
discussion with the planning board? Did they have any concerns? Were there any questions about sourcing? They did not. They did start this project, this um, project prior to my arrival, but since I've been here, I have not heard them question that. I, I presume that this is not the digital map that we're going to be uh, paying for. This is a this is just a PDF. This is just a snapshot of the map. There there's a link, and I don't know if you can access it easily, but there's a link right now that goes to the online GIS mapping that has very few layers. We don't have all of well, the assessing data connected to it, but you can see the parcels with the zoning. However, the parcels have not been updated. We don't have that current data yet. So the actual digital map is online and it's going to be better than this map. It's the one that you can zoom in and out. This is just an image of what that looks like when you're zoomed out. Well, I guess I presume that the digital map would be reasonably accurate. And according to Roy, and from what I see here myself, um, again, admittedly involving my own property, this thing isn't even close. If the digital map is going to reflect this map, what are we paying for? So, so again, Andy, you got to think about this in two separate ways. We're paying for a service to take the data that we have and digitize it. So it's not the the digitization of the maps is not the data. Those are two separate things. Does that make sense? I understand what you're saying. Okay. Well, I mean, you were just asking what we're paying for. So we didn't actually pay for this. This is a service that KB Cog provided to us. And so what we are going to be doing with the digi digitization that was just approved is taking assessing data and digitizing that. Right. So we're going to take inaccurate zoning data and put it over presumably accurate assessing data. No, what Don is saying is the digital files with zoning are more accurate than this PDF representation is. Is it is that is that fair? I think that's a fair assessment. And I, I would just ask, because I know what Roy's concerns are, and it's pertaining to resources, natural resources, and the different layers there. But what is what area are you talking about, Indy, that you're concerned about? Is it an underlying district like residential or village, or is it a resource-based district? It's a resource-based district. I'm going to have a property that's in, in, uh, in the more, com more commercial zone and in the public water supply zone. And the, and the what this map shows is the public water supply zone occupies three quarters of the property. So you think that's more inclusive than what it should be? Right. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have I, to. I don't want this thrown at me sometime in the future and saying, "Well, you voted for this map. Okay, this map is not accurate." I guess the question would be: Is where is the data coming from that is going to be provided to the tax map conversion? Is it going to come from AV Cog as well? No, it will come from the assessor. So there's the assessing information, and then the zoning map includes zones that are based on the location of resources. So those resource maps came from the state. But KV Cog has merged all this because that they're skilled at GIS and they have access to the different layers. So they have created based on these other layers. So I don't know the answer to Anthony's question. I know that Rory and I had talked and I have a better understanding of, of his concern, but I really have to say, I'm not I'm not familiar with the question, Anthony. So asked. Don, is it fair to say that this isn't, for lack of a better word, an artist rendering of our zones and artistic representation of the zones? It's Well, it's gonna be more accurate than an artist's rendering. But each parcel and each project specific, when it comes in, there's field verification. This is where the shoreline actually is, and this is where the wetlands are. Or we've mapped it as wetlands, but in fact, um, drainage has changed, and they're not wetlands anymore. Or now that there was some logging, and now there are wetlands where there weren't wetlands. It's always going to be field verified. So this is this is the broad zoning map. It should be these things, but at the time of development, it could change. So, Look at this, and they're going to pick when they go out there and Because things do change. I mean, things do change on a halfway road. This, there's more wetlands than this. <laughs> this, yeah. this really doesn't have anything to do with assessing. This is this is just simply. I mean, oh, she's saying like 
I think she's using assessing and. Yeah. I mean, they're going to take into consideration that, you know, I probably have 15 acres of trees now. I don't know the answer to that. That's an it, it, well, question. The, well, the answer to that is the answer to that is yes, because it's the the answer to that is yes, because it's as as Don just said. Whenever we go out, whenever the appraiser goes out to assess the value, they are boots on the ground, so they'll be able to determine. You know, we're, no, they're they're going to be as as Don just said. It's going to be field verified, so they're going to be boots on the ground determining how, if you've got. 10 acres, how much of that is, is well? Right. What I'm saying is when they do that, and I guess my problem is, I just, yeah. but we're talking about apples and kumquats here. I mean, we're talking about assess, assessing data and zoning. And those as long are as we don't eat any things. elephants, Anthony. If there was a significant change that required the map to be amended, that would be a process that would have to go to the planning board and the council. So I, so the answer is no. If the assessor goes out, it would actually require a map amendment. Well, so I, I, code, en code enforcement and for um, planning board purposes, they will use this map. Yes. For... So I might have a problem with that. Um, so as far as uh, planning and projecting, you know, a uh, developer comes in, is looking to uh, initiate a project, they're going to be referencing this map. And I would be a lot more comfortable if we had specific references rather than just, you know, their GIS. I would like to see where they got that information. I would hope that the planning board would want to know that as well. Um, so that's my concern. So Don, what's the solution here? I, I just want to make a comment to that real quick is that the narrative is always the one you fall to. So the the zoning ordinance describes the districts, not by map and lot, not, you know, it, it's more in a general way, but you would always go for that before you go for the map. So that would be correct, but it's not in the detail that you're talking about. And well, so what happens if my surveyor comes to the planning board and says, this map is wrong, I surveyed it, okay? And this map shows that the property goes 90% of the way up a 2,000 foot property line and it's a 1,000 foot setback and this map is wrong. It's field verified. So it would be based on the survey because the surveyor is gonna put their credentials on the line or wetland scientists. They're gonna be the ones that are saying in the field on the face of the earth, these are the conditions. So this map isn't the Bible. If a property owner has a survey, then that's what the, any Not particular exactly. board or authority has to go the by. The planning board would be the one to interpret that yes. information. So if someone, a member of the planning board says, well, geez, I'm looking at this map right here, you know, and, you know, there's a conflict there, then, yeah, I think that would cause a delay, potentially, in further investigation. Potentially, for sure. We have a question in the audience. Uh, with regards to the work, not the ordinances, but the, the, the zoning issues, how did, just out of curiosity, how does that apply to lakefront property? It's a water drill land zoning would be shown on here. Okay. Which is uh, 200. Yeah, you can get it. 250 feet. 250 feet. 250, yeah. But it is, it's, it's appropriated on the map by a key. Okay. So broken down and listed out in our zoning ordinance. In and this is a good example in terms of field verifying. So if on the map, the shoreland zone looks like it encompasses your entire property. Well, maybe the surveyor goes out and in fact it doesn't, or maybe it encompasses your property and your neighbor's property. Those things you're not gonna know for certain until it's field verified because these are not surveyed maps. So it, what you're saying is a surveyor would take precedence over this map. Correct. Okay, that's all I needed. 
And that's what I was referencing to the consultant as well. Once we have surveyed information, we're going to ask for the digital files. And we haven't to date because we haven't had a way to use them, but we'll ask for the digital files and then the consultant will update your tax map information. So it will be more accurate because we always now have to say this is not survey quality, but eventually it'll be closer. Can you just remind us again what this, um, the adoption is looking to achieve, what that'll achieve? What the intent is, what's on your zoning maps today is now reflected in this map with no changes. So whatever your zone is today, that's what should be the zone under this map. And if there are changes, then there are errors that we would have to correct. Put that in. Can we have a motion saying we'd like a verification? You got to give us some guidance here. Yeah. So if there are certain things that you would like to be that seem unclear or, you know, you want answers on, if if they're fairly simple, I would think a motion including, you know, verification of this would be, you know, appropriate. If it's a more broader question, then I would suggest tabling it and I'll get more information for you. It wouldn't go back to the planning board. I think I would just be feel there or verifying the sources for you all. So what the what planning board has done is they've done this work. They say, we believe this is an accurate depiction of current zoning only. And there's they're asking you to adopt the format. Gotcha. So in order for you to be comfortable to adopt the format, I, you know, you need to have all the information that makes you comfortable with that. The liability disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> James, you had a question? Yes. Don, just it may be a foolish question, but I'm reading this map and it's showing wetlands, you know, here, the legend over here showing wetlands is a little marshy area, but they're in the white area. They're not, they're not green to where they would probably be a resource protection or anything like that. Is that, they're, why is that? They're going to be smaller wetlands that don't fall under resource protection. So on a given parcel, there may be wetlands. Um, they're just not of the nature which the state says has to fall under resource protection. Right. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm questioning the map a little bit. And Roy just shared the map that he had from the state. And it's showing that some of this is not lining up. I would think that we'd probably want to make sure we're lined up with the state a I little. One thing I might be able to do, Anthony, is talk to Joel at KB Cog and see if maybe we can have a demonstration with the GIS layer in turning some of these things on and off. That might help the conversation. Yeah, I'd like. Well, but yeah, because that will verify some of their data. Mm -hmm. Point of order. I would like to know. I mean, this is just specific to my property because I know my property, but I can tell you this is the uh, wildlife habitat resource protection map right here that we're supposed to be referring to with this here, as I, as I understand it, the resource protection, correct? Well, there are certain ones that are outlined in the zoning ordinance that refer, not every state map or habitat map applies. It's the ones that are called out in the resource protection district in the zoning ordinance. This is the resource protection district Okay. here. Yep. This is the map. It's off by, like I said, a half or over half a mile. That's pretty significant. I mean, I not it is what it is. The property is what it is once it's field verified, but I don't want my property labeled as resource protected with a bunch of other contingent, you know, problems. And that's not the intention. Uh, I want to be clear. Is it I understand that's not the intention, zoning. but I don't, you know, I don't want to go I don't I would like to have it straightened out before it goes into play. I'd rather uh, made a point of order. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to table this uh, until the next meeting. Uh, it'll allow everybody to uh, get it together a little bit better. Discussion? Yeah, I, items on what? I could just repeat back what I'm hearing. Um, you want me to be able to come back and the questions that you're having in terms about where the data is coming from and where it's located. It would, what, I'm, what I think I'm going to do to try to address that is to, to come back with layers, the ability to turn layers on and off so that that will hopefully make sense and yes, become their clear. Their layers should match up with what we have here, correct? Correct. Well, yeah. Okay, oh, there's a... But I would like everybody to think about, okay, uh, don't think about my 30 years dealing with this map and the state's maps. 
is they're kind of like it's like an artist you know that just throws ink at the canvas, really you know but uh this is what we have david gog took this from the state so we might be able to solve this by just including a statement on the map that says something like all zoning boundaries are subject to certified field survey by a licensed surveyor and that, that will solve it yeah all right, that's already been second. There has been a motion and a second uh, to table the updated zoning map as recommended. Favor? All are in favor. Thank you. And this is specific to resources. Okay. Overall accuracy, but I think you would be able to shore that up with them just showing you where they got. The yeah. So like the edge of the village zone is not the question, it's the resources. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 113, consideration of a resolution authorizing the town to establish investment accounts at Kennebec Savings, authorizing town treasurer Anthony Wilson and finance director Nicholas Poole to access and make decisions regarding the funds and requiring that they be authorized to transfer funds from the account. So, and um, you probably saw an email exchange uh, that involved Bruce from late last week and Bruce and our investment banker talked and so as a result, you have before you a separate sheet that wasn't in your packet, uh, an updated uh, resolution that includes uh, the last paragraph that says further resolved with regards to closing the investment account and or transfer request of account to another entity may only be initiated and transacted with written approval from the town council. And I think that, uh, Bruce, that 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 much satisfied your your question. It did. We want the whole council or just the, just the finance? No, I'd, I'd like to have the full council. Anything that involves a large sum of money just from a an electronic transparency. Um, so there's nothing left to the imagination. Was there any concern about the ability to act on investments in a timely manner? No, not at all. So this this really just related to closing out an account. And, and, and I think it's appropriate that the council should be the one to decide. That sort finance of manager and the town manager can move money within the fund so when the funds canceled out for whatever reason we have to be in the loop and vote on so in addition to what is posted on the agenda uh hyperlink to it there is an additional statement further resolved with regards to closing the investment account and or transfer request of account to another entity may only be initiated and transaction transacted with written approval from the town council I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as presented. I'll second. All in favor? All are in favor? All right, moving on to item 114, discussion and consideration of updating and amending chapter four of the Win town of Winthrop personnel policy. Yeah, so we've updated chapters one through three. And so this chapter uh, relates to compensation. It has been reviewed by and discussed with all of the department of directors. And so the, the more substantial changes involving a change from compensatory time to flex time, and that's something that we've uh, talked about in the past, and this is for uh, exempt, in other words, salaried employees, and uh, we explained uh, there what flex time means, uh, requiring employees when they're out of town and for, let's say, training purposes or whatever to use a town credit card for their expenses. That way it provides a clean paper trail for all those expenses and would eliminate the need for any sort of a cash advance. Um, eliminating the reimbursement for long distance phone calls. So you see how long it's been since this uh, policy has been uh, updated. That's no longer a, a consideration. And also eliminating unnecessary oversight by the town manager, including dictating where uniform should be laundered, which seems like a something that doesn't need to be made, a decision that doesn't need to be made by the organization's chief executive. So, so what I think there are two avenues if you are agreeable to the to the changes as they've been presented. One is that you I still want to present this to the to the town's attorney, but at first I wanted the, the council's feedback on this before doing that. And if you're good with with what's being proposed here, you could either approve it conditional on the town attorney's review. And if there are any substantive changes, then we would bring those back to the council. Or you could just say, you know what, Anthony, this looks good. Go ahead and send it to the to the town attorney. And once he's weighed in on it, then we could bring it back for your approval. 
employees to use town credit card. Uh, is is this so? Is this in lieu of like bringing back receipts, like getting reimbursed? Oh no, you no. Once you use a town credit card, you still have to bring back a receipt in what order mean, to. What if they use their own and then came back with receipts? Like, say, there's not a card available. Say, it's still expensive. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we we could just without. It's yes. Not yes. Petty cash. Yes. Yes. We could still do that, but. The preference is always that instead of reimbursing someone, you use a town credit card. And we've got town credit cards that that we can hand out to someone for a specific purpose. And we would rather them use the town credit card. I just wanted to make sure the flexibility was still there. Yes. 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 We see it. That's right. Yeah. The good thing is it doesn't necessarily like that. So, so I mean, what happens is the the statement and the receipts are reviewed. So, who approves it? The department head, or do you approve the expense report? Both. Both. See it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're very the statement itself. Oh yeah, not but yeah. But the, the, total, the total was bizarre. I mean, we and Jim's really good at it too. Yeah, marketed, you know, say six hundred dollars and we're like, what's that about? He would yeah. and yeah. and and we're fortunate to have a an excellent finance assistant who uh if there's something that doesn't look quite right to her, she always brings it to my attention. Uh, I move to approve the updates and amendments to chapter four of the town of Winthrop personnel policy Second. as presented pending a review by the town's attorney with any substantive changes requiring a subsequent council approval. Is it as presented or pending? Uh, Wait, what? As presented. Yeah. So, well, well it's, it, approval. Yes, pending approval okay. by the town attorney. Okay. Second. No, when second. seconded it. I have one question too. So are we, one more question mm -hmm. discussion. The we're preferring that they pay with the procurement contract, saying that they will pay with it. Yes. Page. Yes. Question. Yeah. Ma mainly, I was uncomfortable with the the notion that we'd be handing out cash to people before they go uh, on a on a business trip. That's what it was a petty cash file, it was like twenty bucks. Stop it, Sonic. Yeah. Or gas or diesel bag. Yeah. I just don't think that's as clean of a paper trail as, as using a credit card. Motion a second. So um the on section well, I gotta find my two. parents two. Uh, the unless otherwise dictated by a collective bargaining agreement. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so in our collective bargaining agreements, typically the employee has a uh, choice between whether they'd rather be compensated with time off at a rate of time and a half versus being paid for overtime. It's not. That's correct. If you're an exempt employee, you are not paid overtime. And so that's where the that's that's where the flex time comes in, as opposed to the comp compensatory time. So, in other words, uh, we'll have flex time. So, for instance, Roy, I showed up at seven o'clock this morning. Um, it's seven o'clock right now. Let's say we're here for another two hours. I will have been at work for thirteen or fourteen hours today. <laughs> So if on Friday I decide, you know what, I'm kind of tired. I think I'm going to take off early at three o'clock. Then, then that's the flex time. It's not. It's not a. It's not a one for one trade off. It's not certainly not a one for one and a half trade off. That is the nature of being a salaried employee. That certainly isn't the rule by nature. I mean, you're signed on to work until the job's done. You know whether. It's, you know, you don't say, oh, geez, I got four hours here. Well, I'll take four hours off earlier. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, being a salaried employee does allow you some 
flexibility in your, in your schedule. But um, yeah, I don't worry about our salaried employees working less than 40 hours a week. All right. All in favor? Item 115, consideration of approving the town's ballot for district representatives to the Maine Municipal Association's legislative policy. And we did receive uh, for our district the um, candidate profiles for Gary Lamb. He's a city manager of Hollowell and our own town manager, Anthony Wilson. Yeah, and so, and so each community votes for two candidates there's only two of us, unless there's a strong ride in for Woodrow Woodpeckers or some such. Uh, Still a run. <laughs> so, so I'll entertain a motion if you'd like to vote move for to approve state. voting for the Hollowell City Manager Gary Lamb and Winthrop Town Manager Anthony Wilson to represent District 14 on the Maine Municipal Association's Le Legislative Policy Committee. Second. Yes, I will pass it around in just a moment. All right, all in favor? All in favor? All right, item 116, consideration of approval of the minutes of the June 3rd, June 17th, and June 24th, 2024 council meetings. Motion to approve. A second. All in favor? All are in favor? Item 117, consideration of recommendations from the appointments committee. Do you have any appointments? I do not have any appointments. Several. We have a handful of vacancies, yeah. We could really uh, get somebody to participate in the assessment and review committee. I think we're a couple members short there. I'll have to look into that, Bruce. I think you're right, but yeah. It's pretty important, especially with a reassessment coming up. Yeah. And, um, somebody with. Well, and typically, you know, it won't be long before tax statements start uh, going out. And that's when the uh, that's when the appeals start. Maybe we should put a thing out. OK. Yeah. No, I serve on the board of assessment review in my in the community where I live. Yeah, I do. Luckily, we've never had to meet, so it's a sweet assignment. All right, so moving on to other business, I'll open it up for public comment. If there is anything from the audience or on Zoom? Seeing anything, so we'll move. Oh, go ahead, James. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, Shannon, do you want to explain what's going on? Yes. So I know it's been a, a little while. It was um, I had met with the chairs and represent representatives of the different committees to go back and make some revisions to our committee's uh, roles, responsibilities, and procedures document that we adopted in December. Uh, and so uh, it's just been something on my plate. Okay. that I haven't scheduled. And um, I was actually looking at it because when we had our discussion, there was um, concern about having both boards and planning um, and committees on the same document because some apply to state statutes and some are good practices. Right. Uh, so where one is binding, one is not necessarily, it's a matter of taking them apart and separating them out or just keeping them together, but delineating. So. Um, it's a little bit more extensive. But do we have an open? Didn't Bob Pelletier resign? He did. Yep. Did Shortly, we... like the week after we had that meeting. Right. So I know they haven't met since then. Yeah. I'm a little confused as to what Mr. Pelletier's role is with the committee at this point. He, he resigned. I know he resigned, but he also sent a, uh, a message recently that Indi that indicated he was speaking for the committee and saying they would not meet until until this right there are questions about yeah. the okay. the committee I could, I could see we'd be confused on cemeteries um at the historical society sure. i think on thursday all right um thank you boy 
after the meeting, uh, I've mentioned about the tax committee, and it, so it's, it's a personnel issue. Tax review. Okay. Anything else from the council? All right, we'll move to the town manager's report. All right, so looking ahead to our August 5th meeting, spoke uh, last week with Phil Socher, the town's attorney, about uh, the possibility of extending our TIF district. And uh, it, the TIF district expires in 2026, and the TIF district, the tax increment financing district, is the Carlton Mill complex. And so what I'd like to do is extend that that uh, district for another 10 years so that we can hopefully see some movement in as far as um, developing uh, that. And in doing so, we can also reset the parameters of the incentives that are involved with the uh, TIF district, particularly to try to incentivize some um, affordable housing development there. And in fact, uh, Phil said that there's now a new state law that would allow you to extend a TIF district by another 20 years so that in this case, we could be extending it 30 years. And that extra 20 year window would allow specifically for affordable housing development. Now, the reason that's important is because for someone to develop affordable housing, they're gonna need a pretty significant window in order to recoup their investment. And so, so anyway, so we have some, what I'm saying is we have some options available to us and ex, uh, potentially extending the TIF. And Phil is agreeable to coming to our August 5th meeting via Zoom to give you a sort of a briefing on TIF 101, just so everyone has a full understanding about what a TIF is and what it does, and then what the options are for us in potentially extending the TIF. May I comment? Okay. Um, the, the money that we have given up by way of this TIF over the years is horrendous for the return that we've gotten to date. And I don't really want to criticize you or anything, but I would, not like, I would not like to talk as if we're going to renew it. I think the current holders of the TIF need more encouragement than that. I think they need to know that if they don't play ball, um, they're not gonna have a TIF. OK, um, you know, it, it's just horrendous what it's cost us and what they've done. And as a matter of fact, the current business that's in the building is shrinking. So, so, Andy, I get the sense that you don't like what's been done with the TIF. And this is a perfect opportunity to totally reconfigure how the TIF operates so that we are more comfortable with the parameters under which someone would receive TIF funding. In other words, it would be performance based, right? That would be good. And and one of the and one of the options that Phil will explain to you, if you guys want to hear from him on August fifth, is that one of those performances could be based upon the amount of square footage that is developed within the mill. Uh, you know, another option would be the number of jobs that's created. But in this instance, you know, we're looking at more of a mixed use with more residential uses. That's not going to create any sort of jobs, but we can ensure that the that the properties are developed and then returned to the tax roll. Jean Green. He's yes, he's he, he's very much interested in this. And 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 keep in mind, you know, I think we've got an, a good opportunity here simply because both the DEP and the EPA are teaming and providing the funding for an environmental assessment of that plant right now. And they've said that they would like to help in whatever issues that they find to help to pay to resolve those. And that's going to be more attractive to a developer to come in and actually redevelop the property. What is if someone else in town that has a similar property then wants to have a discussion no, oh, we'd have that discussion. All right. Uh, Does the TIF include all of the mill property? Yes. It's, it's not it's, a certain. It's section. like 4.36 acres total. It doesn't seem like that's all of it. It's just. Yep. All the buildings, all the, all the land. All yep. The land. It's the totality of the property. 
But what about a new skating ponds? All right. Uh, just an update. July 15th is when our sidewalk grant is uh, application is due. Uh, we've been working steadily on that. I think we're, we're really close. Um, now, with the figures that we've been provided by Maine DOT of the cost of construction per linear foot of sidewalks, I mean, we're looking at potentially like a two and a half million dollar project. Now, we think that that's high, um, but the DOT has also encouraged us not to skimp on the application because, like I said earlier, it'll be a three-year project, so inflation will be a factor. And then also, they said they would rather that we apply for more funding than less. And then, you know, once they do the engineering and design phase of the project, then we'll have a better understanding of what the, the cost would be. About five hundred thousand. If it were a two and a half million dollar project, it'd be five hundred thousand over over three years. Just the top of the hill to down here, or is it from the top all the way down to one thirty? No, it's from the is from um, Metcalf Road down to Route thirty three, and then keep in mind um, there are portions of that sidewalk course both sides of the road. So, so we're actually talking about nearly in linear feet a miles worth of of sidewalk. It, but that also includes all of the curbing and widening it and potentially having to acquire uh, easements. And uh, when we did the initial revitalization back in 2009, 10, when they kind of, they stopped, they rebuilt the, when they put the lamppost in and they rebuilt, they stopped right past Kennebec savings. Why would we have to redesign? We're not, that's not, that would not be part of the project. So, so the, so that, so, so that portion, that portion of the sidewalk, uh, that cement there in the heart of the village, that's not part of this project. That, that, that would go beyond that because they had stopped, which is why we have this weird little hump on Main Street there because they, for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so, so from, that area would then include beyond that towards like Methodist Church. So, so, so from the point that, the cement sidewalk ends all the way down to 133. That would be part of the project. Seems really high. Well, we don't know exactly what the costs are at this point. That's why I wanted to bring it up so that so that there wouldn't be a gag reflex. Well, Linda, what we're talking about is with the DOT, with the DOT, they would pay if it if it were a two and a half million dollar project, they'd pay two million. We'd pay a half million. Yeah, it's a 2080 split. And are we committed if we put this application in? You know? No. Well, then we do. But but they but they typically do like to, you know, if once they design it, they typically do like to follow through on the construction. And I think you know, I think I think one of the things about it being a three year project is it does give us time to plan financially for it. Additionally, one of the options would be because it is infrastructure that has been neglected and that needs to be improved is that we could use a portion of our road paving money for a year or two in order to help fund our portion of the project. When they design this, do we know, are they like tearing it out like granite versus R versus cement? You can be able to. Yes. So, so what we've included in the, uh, in the application is this, the walking surface itself would be, asphalt but there would be probably a mix of granite and concrete curbing we do not want asphalt curbing because it does not weather snow plows very well ideally we'd have all granite because it does and it looks nice but you know that sort of remains to be seen depending upon the design of the project and, and two, so so one of the things that may be inflating that cost, and the DOT has said, you know, it's probably not going to cost this much for that, but we have counted 51 parcels that abut our sidewalks. And so we've allowed for the maximum amount of $5,000 per parcel, depending upon how each of those parcels is going to be impacted. And so the DOT has said, you know, it's probably not going to be quite that much in which it will lower, which lowers everything else. Um, uh, but we're including it just 
so that it is there as opposed to not including it and then find out that we need that. And so, the, you know, in addition to repaving the sidewalks, it also would be widening the sidewalks because they do not currently meet ADA standards, which are, which is 60 inches. And you'd have to move an awful lot of utility poles out of the sidewalk right now. And so we've already been in contact with CMP and with the DOT about moving those poles. CMP is already planning on doing that on the western end. Is it western? The end close, the, the end on the hill. Uh, and you may have seen some stakes and all that are already down there where they're planning on moving it. They were planning on moving the pole 65 to 67 inches uh, away from the inside curbing. The DOT suggested that 72 inches would be a, a better figure. And so we put CMP and the utility coordinator for the DOT region in contact with one another so that they can work on that together. Yeah, and yeah, we have to do something. And if we end up going on our own without this, we're not going to get very far for half a million dollars. If we have to do it on our own, it'll never get done. Anyway, all right. I just wanted to, I just didn't want you guys to be surprised uh, uh, if a $500,000 price tag came with, with the project. Uh, speaking of big projects, we had our first meeting today with our radio communications contractor, and it was very well. And so they're going to be starting on that uh, straight away. And one of the things that we discussed with them is that, you know, we anticipate getting this federal earmark that will pay 55 percent of the cost. And so we need to make sure that we don't get too far over our skis uh, in doing that so that we're doing stuff uh, before we have the money in hand from the federal government. They were perfectly fine with that. So, so that was good news. And in fact, last week, uh, Shannon and I met with um, an aide from Senator Collins office just about that project. And she was very encouraging about it and gave us some good advice on, you know, uh, applications that we may want to submit in the future. So that was all very encouraging. Just a reminder, there will be fireworks at 9 PM Thursday evening at Norcross point. And then there's uh, the first summer concert on Sunday afternoon at Norcross Point. Uh, ZISC uh, parking. So you folks saw some emails uh, late last week regarding that. Dawn is planning tomorrow to go over to the ZISC house and can, they've submitted a parking plan and confirm if what is in their plan is on the ground and meets the, the code. If it does, then they will then have their permit for operating essentially a boarding house uh, at that property. So um, Mr. Skillings seemed to indicate that uh, if they have that certificate of occupancy and the code enforcement officers looking back through the files just to make sure that they have a building inspection report from prior years, um, they seem to indicate that they may or may not need uh, a letter of support from the council in order to proceed with its permit application or its license to the state. So, but we will keep you folks posted on that. Uh, there's, we've had a question as to whether or not uh, the Grange can put their scarecrows on the, uh, on the light post this fall. Can I, can I correctly assume that you folks have no, no issue with that? I'm on board. Go for it. All right. That's all I have. Do you have one other thing real quick? Okay. Just have a quick question, and then I have a, an update. Um, down at the mill dam, the Carlton Mill dam, uh, be able to put up a fence or adjust the side, or is that personal property? I mean, I know that there's been some discussion. Uh, heard something. Yeah. Sorry, the other side. It's, it's it's actually. Oh, okay. So. It's, yeah, it, both sides. The the side where reds used to be. That, yeah, I think that's private. It's an old wood fence. Anybody could fall in there. I brought that up way heck back when Jeff was still here. And uh, the same thing over the parks. That's private, too. That was just a question. Unfortunately. I met with the Downtown Revitalization Committee on Thursday. Uh, so they just had a couple of questions. I figured I'd just bring it up real quick. I can pass it on to Dawn. Uh, they just wanted to know if it was okay to change the name from Village Revitalization to Downtown Revitalization. 
Does anybody have any concerns with calling it downtown versus village? <laughs> Essentially, that's what we're we're downtown what, revitalization what, plan. With their task task for. Okay. I think the charge was village revitalization, so they just wanted to confirm. As long as they. As long as they get the job done, they can call themselves whatever they want. Know. They'll include uh, uptown. Uh, and then also they were just asking if the town council would be the overseers of decorations downtown as far as um, clean up or take down. Uh, would we be the ones that would uh, any kind of decorations, sports, scarecrows, things like that, making sure like enforcement uh, that we are just directing. them. I actually think it'd be a good idea to put the downtown revitalization committee in charge of developing some sort of aesthetic for downtown, what we want downtown to look like, including the sort of decorations that we have down there. I think it would lend some consistency. I agree, but didn't we approve the flower? You did. Yeah, yeah, so. But but I have to say, I, I'm not so sure that those are going to have much of a lifespan. I mean, they're. Yeah, I think you might be right. Yeah. So I, I just have one thing. Uh, it's primarily, I guess, for Anthony. But back before... And uh, when you first came with us, we were uh, in the process of losing a grant for the uh, Welters Point Winter Beach uh, Rehab. And the reason the council wanted the grant, the council approved, I think it was a million dollars in matching funds to borrow. And with all the mess, we just couldn't keep up and we lost it. Um, but nevertheless, it remained or remains really the will of the council to uh, try to get another grant, get something done. So I'm hoping that at some point, I know you're busy. Okay, I really do. Um, but I, that we can take another look at that because that will involve, one of the big issues when it was initially raised is the erosion is terrible. Okay, the riprap at Welch's Point was never put in properly. Um, you know, the beach is eroding, the dock is a danger. Um, and, you know, we're talking, Back then, we were talking a million and a half dollars to straighten it out, and probably more now. So I, I really, at some point, if you could get that off the back burner, that would be great. It's on the list. Thank you. Are you talking about just East Winth of Welch's Point Beach? Grant, I'm sorry. I worked on the Welch's Point project, too, so I just misspoke. It's 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 Norcross Point. Okay. Yeah. The Welch's Point project is well and truly done, and the town's got a couple hundred grand in their pocket. A bit confusing because that was we'll one project we made money on. <laughs> so I think that wraps it up for our meeting. We'll move into an executive session. So we'll say thank you to all residents. Lewis, Susan, good luck. Thanks. I move that we move into executive session uh, pursuant to one MRSA section four hundred five. Uh, 6A pers for personal matters. Uh, you'll see. Thank you. Nice Thank you. A second. Um, hello. I am slow. Okay. Uh, 70.